Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this debate goes to the heart of what we are facing in this country. It may appear to be a simple amendment from seven days to five days, but it really speaks of this government's appreciation of the situation that we face. That we listened this morning to the debate on the extension of the state of emergency. And you heard the responses and concluded with the Prime Minister summing up. And when you examine it, you really are at a loss as to why it is that something that seems as common sense cannot be seen as accepted by common sense. And when I saw the proposed amendment, I was wondering why. Why can't it not be seen? And I got my answer today in the response of the Prime Minister. And Mr. Speaker, we will debate and we will try to score points. We, we, we do it. This is politics. We do. So my parliamentary rep, the member for Grosley, spent half an hour talking about roads. Now, Mr. Speaker, I will say to you, I can't be against roads. I certainly want the road in Bassett Joseph to be fixed and the road in Marigo and in Monkey Tongue to be fixed. I don't have a problem if roads been fixed, but I want you to take care of the welfare of the people first in this crisis that we are facing in this country. But let's put that aside for now, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you listen to the members opposite, and if you analyze this amendment that has been proposed, you would swear that all is well in this country. You would swear that we are handling the COVID crisis with aplomb. You would never believe we have the worst statistics in the Eastern Caribbean, including Barbados. You would swear that we have the best quarantine facilities in St. Lucia. And that all St. Lucians who require quarantine, a place is provided for them. You would swear that our isolation facilities are up to match, Mr. Speaker, and that the thousand odd cases in St. Lucia are well catered for, Mr. Speaker. If you listen to the members opposite, if you hear the lightheartedness and the triviality with which they treat the crisis facing this country. A short while ago, the press release stated three more deaths, 110 positive cases out of 247. That's a rate of about 47%, if my math serves me right, or 44%. Think about that. 44% or so. 247 persons were tested, 110 were positive. What percentage is this? Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, if you listen, you believe that testing and tracing in this country is something to be proud of. Gentlemen, members, honorable members, we have, and ladies, we have a crisis in this country. St. Lucians are scared. And then you laugh and you joke and you make fun of the arguments that we put forward. And the opposition is right in right in explaining his disposition that as long as we have a crisis in this country, he's not minded to take on some of the trivialities, Mr. Speaker. I listened to the member from Grosley speak about income support, and maybe some work is being done and there is some support given. But Mr. Speaker, the old lady in Fuashu that needs some food that has not been getting, the lady in Bassa Joseph who looked at me 
and annoyed at me. And by the way, she supports the United Workers Party. And she says to me, when they come with their van, giving out food, it's not people like her they look out for. And I have to explain to you, I'm not the one distributing it. It's a Ministry of Health van that is bringing the food. There are people that are crying out for support, for basic supplies. I have constituents, and I always give those stories because I face them. The lady who came to me and said to me, she's taking her diabetic medicine and metformin every other day because she can no longer afford to buy it where she can have her medication every day. That's reality in this country. That's the crisis that we face. And you wonder whether there is a denial or whether they've just accepted that the people of St. Lucia is collateral, so there will be collateral damage in saving this economy to their satisfaction. There is a crisis, Mr. Speaker. I heard the Prime Minister say that second testing in Barbados failed almost as a justification why we should not have it in St. Lucia because it failed in Barbados. I don't know where he got this from. The Prime Minister is well known for just making you know, outlandish statements that it failed. And he went on to say that the bubble in St. Lucia is working. Has he not watched, listened, and read the number of cases that we have in St. Lucia? The spike that we are experiencing in St. Lucia? And you're saying to us the bubble is working? And I think he said, and if I'm wrong, he can correct me, he can stand, that only eight tourists tested positive and six of them from one family. I thought I heard him say this, the member from Miku South. Only eight tourists tested positive and six from one family. If I'm wrong, correct me. I was shocked. So he's convinced that he's right in keeping our borders open. But what really struck me, the Prime Minister, I think a colleague of mine from maybe Viewfort North, Saturday discussion about ventilators that were in boxes. And the Prime Minister, we described it as a ridiculous, asinine discussion, and he was at his condescending best. Mr. Speaker, to describe a discussion as asinine and the people taking part in it as asinine, if I am objecting to this amendment, and you would call it an asinine discussion, this is derogatory of the highest order. And let me bring out my Latin. Asinine comes from the Latin word asinus, meaning extremely stupid, relating to an ass or a donkey. And he is saying that the discussion started by my colleague was a ridiculous and asinine discussion insulting, degrading, Mr. Speaker. A serious parliamentary debate. Now, he may not have agreed with my colleague, and he could have said that, that I don't agree, that you don't have all the facts. He could have said that, but he described it as a ridiculous, asinine statement, Mr. Speaker. He described the shutdown as stupid, and we don't understand as if, if people are offering an alternative view to yours, they automatically become stupid and they know nothing. So the Prime Minister has a monopoly on knowledge in this country. So does this suggest any monopoly of knowledge? I heard the CSA call for it. I heard the Medical and Dental Association call for it. But they play in politics. If you ask for a lockdown in this country, to try to control the spike, then you're playing politics in this country. Because you're opposed to what they are proposing, Mr. Speaker. You know, you hear things about the police chief and his Labour Party that bring in English... Of course, English police officers were brought in to advise the police force. Who made the Englishman the commissioner of police? It wasn't no Labour Party. It wasn't. But let's put that aside. Let's talk about COVID, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, when you listen to this government and you talk to St. Lucians 
about their everyday experiences with COVID. When you hear their cries, their stories, it's a story of failure after failure after failure. Just look at the statistics, Mr. Speaker. How many deaths we had in November? How many deaths in December? How many deaths in January? We're having deaths now of almost one every 40 hours. Almost every 40 hours. Well, I haven't calculated for the free they announced today. Before today, we were having a death every 41 hours. Think about that. Every 41 hours, St. Lucia was dying, in, somebody was dying in St. Short of COVID. And with the new statistics, it might be even shorter. And you want to dismiss people, treat them as stupid, even calling them asinine because they oppose you. And Mr. Speaker, you know in this house, I take part in the Pekong too. And I take and I give. But do not treat people who are representing their constituents and pointing to an alarming situation with such disdain. Mr. Speaker, we were supposed to make sure, and this speaks to it, that we keep our borders strong and secure. This amendment speaks to that. But instead, Mr. Speaker, we were more concerned at selling our island as being COVID-free, a COVID-free paradise to the same countries with high COVID levels. That's what we were doing, Mr. Speaker. And you know, of course, some of the Prime Minister operatives were selling him in that whole marketing for us as an international man. You know, he can represent us, at, you know, internationally. The Prime Minister was on every station anywhere in the world he could find. The UK, the US, promoting St. Lucia and saying how successful we were in managing COVID and that people should come to St. Lucia because we were open for business, virtually inviting as much tourists as possible to come to St. Lucia. I saw a clip of an Englishman who came to St. Lucia and he said he had to quarantine before he went to the U.S. So St. Lucia was a quarantine spot. I think almost everyone in here probably saw it. It made international news. And of course, we all remember during all of that, when children didn't have laptops, no Wi-Fi, and no access to the internet, they were boasting that the Prime Minister, he was boasting that he was a product of Canada and that his children go to school there. Every action of the government was to encourage more and more people to come to St. Lucia. And like the member from Ancillary Canary said, the tourists, in one of these ads, the tourists are missing their color. So come to St. Lucia for it, in the midst of handling the COVID pandemic. It was as if the resort debt of this government was about going and encouraging more and more people from high-risk countries to come in on holiday during the pandemic. We won the government, Mr. Speaker. The leader of opposition won the government that the more people you bring in, the greater the risk of importing cases. We urge the government to be serious about the front door, but they were insisting on a narrative about the back door and about the SLP match. They continue to push that narrative. So from the very beginning, Mr. Speaker, we raised concerns about this, but the government threw caution to the wind. Mr. Speaker, the government says we won't they won't introduce a second test because the average tourist only stays on island for eight days. Six days? For six days. So is it not possible for someone to get infectious, to be infectious during the six-day window? Is it not? Is there something different about the anatomy of the tourists that prevents them from getting sick while on vacation if they had already come infected, Mr. Speaker? The science tells us that even asymptomatic persons can spread the virus. You don't have to have symptoms to spread the virus. You don't have to cough or sneeze to spread the virus. In fact, the research says that you are most infectious two to three days prior to the onset of symptoms. 
So what's this illogical argument about a visitor spending six days on the island and then we don't have to do a second test? You know, Mr. Speaker, let me just share with you what some of the Caribbean islands are doing to show you how out of sorts we are with this amendment. In St. Kitts, Mr. Speaker, you are required to take a PCR test up to 72 hours, three days, prior to departure from your country of origin. Three days. You must download a COVID-19 contact tracing app and guests must stay on the hotel property for seven days. Between days 8 and 14, visitors must pay 150 US to undergo a second PCR test. And if on day 8 the travelers test negative, they can then book and go on approved tours. Those staying beyond 14 days must then get a third PCR test, after which they can integrate freely with the society. That's St. Kitts. They have 40 cases, four active, and no deaths. That's St. Kitts. Dominica, Dominica. Like St. Lucia, you must take a negative PCR test, but no more than three days prior to departure. In Dominica, when you arrive on the airport, you must do a rapid antigen test. Although you've done a PCR three days before departure, you still do a rapid on arrival. If you are negative, you can then go to your approved hotel where you must stay on property. Dominica has a total of 121 cases, 11 are active, and no deaths. I can give you, Mr. Speaker, Grenada. I can give you all the other Caribbean countries, Mr. Speaker, to show you what the, what the practice is. Mr. Speaker, the vast majority of countries around the world require pre-testing for COVID prior to departure. The ideal is to test as close as possible to the point of departure or at the point of arrival. Many countries do second testing four to seven days after arrival. In July 2020, in July 2020, the WHO, the World Health Organization, said laboratory test, PCR testing immediately prior to departure or on arrival may provide information about the status of travelers. We had seven days in St. Lucia. Seven days. In the majority of cases around the world, and the leader of the opposition gave you a list of some of them, they have, Mr. Speaker, a three-day or 72-hour window for travel for getting a test before they leave. Mr. Speaker, today we have been asked to move from seven days to five days. Why can't we adopt the world standard? Why? Why can't we adopt the standard used by other Caribbean countries? Surely, Mr. Speaker, the argument and the belief that countries, it will be too difficult to get a test in three days and get your results is not really sensible. We know these are more developed countries with greater capacity, and it can be done. Now, these are the same countries asking now for tests for their nationals when returning to their countries. These countries are now asking for it. And you would have heard what the UK was announcing today. That you need two tests now. Mr. Speaker, it baffles me. It baffles me why we cannot adopt the world standard and move from five, seven days to three days, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, we don't get a chance to debate the regulations that come with the extension of the state of emergency, Mr. Speaker. But it also adds to the issue of how we respond to the COVID crisis we face in this country. And apart from one or two errors, Mr. Speaker, Somebody need to explain to us in this house, and maybe the prime Min the, minister, the member of Miku South can, why is there certain provisions in the regulation that speak to residents and nationals, and in a couple of instances to a person? 
and I, and I want to read it particularly Regulation 9, 1. A national resident may be required to take a test for COVID-19 based on a health assessment conducted by the chief medical officer or a medical officer authorized by the chief medical officer. What about visitors? Why is it only for national or residents? 9, 2. It speaks of a national or resident. But 9, 3 says a person who takes a test. Now, why a person for nine free, but a national or a resident? And for all the regulations, there are some regulations that's for only nationals and residents, and there are some regulations that's for a person. I take a person to mean visitors, nationals, residents. Why are some of the regulations only for nationals or residents? Again, it comes back to the heart if this is not an error, if this is not an error, it comes down to the critical issue with what we are debating now. How this government is responding to the COVID crisis. It's almost as if this government has just given up on this. We have COVID, learn to exist with COVID. A lot of y'all will get COVID, some will die, but we'll save the economy. This seems to be what is driving the actions of this government. That cannot be right. And it also cannot be right, Mr. Speaker, on a day when Barbados and Dominica are boasting live throughout the region of receiving 100,000 doses from India. And when I said it this morning, I was told about approvals, approval. The AstraZeneca doses they're getting, of course, is produced in India, manufactured in India, so I'm not, I'm not sure whether the members opposite were suggesting that it may be issues of production in India. But Barbados Prime Minister and Dominica Prime Minister are this afternoon boasting of how many thousands of doses they are getting for their vaccines. And tell us again, raising my central concern, what really is the response of this government? And there's a lot of fluff and bluff about how well they're doing, how well it is. And I wonder, are they not living in St. Lucia? Are parliamentarians not hearing the horror stories from the various communities? Or have you become so disengaged, disconnected, that people are not even telling you the horror stories that are going on at OKAU, at the VH Respiratory Hospital, at the, the guest house where they're now using as an isolation facility? Are you not hearing those stories? For you to be giving us the impression that all is well in this country, you're still in the boasting mood of number one in the Caribbean and one of the best in the world. We are not. We are not. And this, Mr. Speaker, should be amended. Not five days, three days. That's world standard. That's what's been done in most Caribbean countries around us. We have a serious issue facing us, Mr. Speaker. Serious issue. So I end, Mr. Speaker, making a humble appeal to the government. We need a more robust response to the crisis that we are facing. We have been given the impression that if there is a lockdown, whether it's for 14 days, that the whole country will collapse and the whole economy will collapse. I don't believe that. I don't. But I might be asinine, so. I heard Mia Motley, Prince of Barbara, says the two-week lockdown will cost the Barbados economy $25 million. A bigger economy than ours, $25 million. I don't know whether she's been conservative. But we have been given the impression that if we have a hard lockdown and make a determined effort to stop the spike once and for all, then all life will disappear in St. Lucia. All livelihoods will be lost. The economy will collapse. Is that really true? So instead, we have been asked to trust in some of the measures, including this one that has been proven to be folly, and let's do it over 90 days, and then eventually we will take care of the problem. A few people will die along the way. Thousands will be infected. But you know what? We did it my way. Our people are suffering from the COVID virus, but also from the social and economic conditions that they're in. And I heard, and I'm really disappointed in my parliamentary rep, the member Grosley, to repeat that giving out 
handouts in their view is medically safe or true. If you give an old lady in her 70s, in her 80s, a basket of food, that's not mendicancy. If you give an old lady who badly needs some medication, uh, now that's not mendicancy. Honorable member. Member for Grizzly. Mr. Speaker, on a point of honor, I'm being misquoted. I said that there are, in fact, those who will require assistance and handouts. Uh, However, our goal is for those who we can take out of their circumstance is to provide them with independence by training them and letting them come out of their situation. That is what I said. Because if you continue to just hand out to people, that will make them mental. Those were my words, and my words have been misrepresented. Mr. Speaker. Honorable member. You heard the member for Grizzly saying that he's been misquoted. Uh, but he just said exactly what I said he said. Huh? I'm, I will read, Mr. Speaker. He if said you would he like to repeat what you said, but he's taking issue with what you say. Okay. Uh, Can you tell me exactly what he said? He said, because I will then say exactly that. He said, if you continue to give assistance to people, then that's mendicancy. That, that's what he said. Yeah. And I'm saying to him, the old lady, 75 years of age, who does not have food in this COVID crisis. Her two daughters used to help her are not employed. If you help her out, that's not many can say. That's my interpretation, and I am championing. No, the two. Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah. Honorable thank member. you very much, Honorable Mr. Member. Speaker. Member. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For you ending your question.